Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Library of Congress and uh, the Thomas Jefferson Building on a lively Thursday night. Uh, my name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of poetry and literature for the Literary Initiatives Office here at the library. And I'm delighted to welcome you to another of our Live at the Library series evenings. If you haven't heard, every Thursday night we leave this building, our historic Thomas Jefferson Building, open late. We offer food and drinks, and we encourage folks from across the city and the area to come in and explore the library, experience events such as this one, and think about how this place and the world's largest library fits perfectly into your life. I'm especially excited about tonight's event, which has been literally years in the making. Let me explain. A decade ago, we launched a series titled Life of a Poet with the near, nearby Hill Center, featuring Washington Post book world critic Ron Charles as our moderator. That series was a huge hit, not only with our audience, but with participating poets as well, in large part due to the way Ron wove together insightful conversation with select readings by the poets, and Ron always chose the poems, which he did for tonight, too. Alas, once the pandemic hit, we stopped Life of a Poet, and we've been waiting for the right time and place to recapture its magic, which is here and now. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. First, please take a moment to turn off or silence your mobile devices. Second, I want to let you know that this event will not include an audience Q&A. However, you can talk to Major afterwards as you meet him and get your book signed. We will have copies of his book for sale in the room across the way. I can't imagine a better poet or book to resume Ron's, Ron's conversations with than Major Jackson and Razzle Dazzle New and Selected Poems, 2002 to 2022. You see, Ron is especially adept at covering the range of a poet's work, and Razzle Dazzle highlights Major's miracles of vision and celebration of language over five poetry collections and two decades. Major is not only an award-winning poet, he's also the host of the podcast, The Slowdown, started by former poet laureate Tracy K. Smith, as well as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the poetry editor of the Harvard Review, and the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Chair in the Humanities at Vanderbilt University. In other words, Major is one of the country's leading ambassadors for the art, and it's wonderful to celebrate his poetry tonight. Please join me in welcoming Major Jackson and Ron Charles. Major, I'm so glad you're here. Man, I've been looking forward to this. I have been looking forward yeah, to this. This is my much. first time we've met, so I prepared a seven hour interview. <laughs> <clears throat> you may think I'm kidding. Uh, in one of Major Jackson's poems, he writes, a startling afternoon of grace awaits us. Mm -hmm. That's a good description of this evening, too, I think. <laughs> I'd like you to begin by reading uh, Let Me Begin Again. Sure. Seems like an appropriate start. <clears throat> this is the first poem in the book, so it's hopefully setting a tone and, um, and, and as well as an aspiration. Let me begin again. Let me begin again as a quiet thought in the shape of a shell slowly examined by a brown child on a beach at dawn, straining to see their future. Let me begin this time knowing the drumming in my dreams is me inheriting the earth, is morning lighting up the rivers. Let me burn my vanities old music in the pines, snifters of scotch, a day moon like a signature of night. This time, 
Let me circle the island of my fears only once, then live like a raging waterfall and grow a magnificent mustache. Let me not ever be the bird cage or the serrated blade or the empty season. Dear glacier, dear sea of stars, dear leopards disintegrating at the outer limits of our greed, soon we will encounter you only in motivational tweets. Reader, I should have married you sooner. <laughs> this time, let me not sleep like the prophet who believes he's seen infinity. Let me run at breakneck speeds toward sceneries of doubt. I have no more dress rehearsals to attend. Look closer, I am licking my lips. Reader, I should have married you sooner. <laughs> I read that and I thought, poet, I should have found you sooner. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> In a poem called Wonderland Trust, you say, writing birthed me. Mm -hmm. How did you first start to think of yourself, to think of yourself as a poet? I fortunately had grandparents who raised me. And while they did not have necessarily a formal library, they had libraries uh, they had books in the home. And my grandmother, particularly, who was um, endowed with the responsibility of raising me and my cousins, um, on rainy days, uh, we couldn't watch TV all day. And so she. You weren't would, allowed to. We were not allowed to watch okay. TV all day. But she would say, go read a book. And I saw books that were this thick, and I saw books that were paperbacks, and then I found a book in which the text only went part of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I <laughs> often would go to Robert Frost and Langston Hughes, and those books genuinely were the only books of poetry in, in our household. Uh, my grandmother picked up books from uh, church basements and flea markets and collected these books. And I really, you know, beyond um, skipping, you know, finding a way around that requirement, yes. those books became meaningful to me, particularly in high school. Um, I prized myself on knowing a good deal of those uh, poems so that when one teacher uh, got to Robert Frost, I had a good deal of them memorized. Wow. So uh, I think he was teaching Nothing Gold Can Stay and asked anyone, asked someone to read it. And I put my hand up and I didn't look down at the book and that earned me an A for the whole year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is pretty impressive. In a funny poem called Blunts, you write about hanging out with your teenage friends on a street corner and getting high for the first time. Amid a fit of coughing, I broke the silence and said, I want to be a poet. <laughs> how, how did your buddies react to that? Uh, you know, I used to say that, that not all poems are um, a record of one's life, <laughs> that poets like to have fun and make things up. Uh, but in that particular instance, there was an equivalent gathering that I remember in which we were sharing what we wanted to be. And while I didn't say poet, I did say writer. Really? And to my friends, uh, particularly this one friend, um, he, he was like, yeah, that, that makes sense for you. Yeah. And I felt seen in a way. Yeah. Uh, not only that, all of us were trying to be rappers. And so our relationship to poetry. language, to right, to poetry was already instilled in us because of the culture. Right. Um, but I had my raps, and then I had another journal that was my poems. And one time, um, on a way to a basketball game, a friend of mine pulled that one out of my bag and started reading. Yeah. And that was, suddenly, I was outed as a poet. What was their reaction? You know, it was... Respect? It was, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. 
uh, no, they 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 laugh, but but they also enjoyed it. There was something different about me, and I think if you have a small crew, you define each other by your difference, not by your sameness. Nice, you know. There's a poem called Pest. You refer to selling poetry on the corners of North Philly. Mm -hmm. Is that true? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I, in, that, in that poem and in other poems in my first book, I was trying to push up against the narrative of young black men right. engaged in activity that was perpetuated by media. And so those particular poems early on wanted to leap from mainstream portraiture of young black men and push towards art because in, in fact, many of us were interested in art, right. either visual arts or wanted to enter into the recording arts. Right. Um, uh, I was, you know, even early on considering myself uh, an aspiring writer. Uh, so to some extent, it may sound funny and surreal, but there was, there was a truth about it. There's a truth about it. But you were, in a sense, publishing your poems there on the street with your friends? Well, not publishing. I mean, I mean that would be great. Broadly speaking. Yeah, broadly speaking. Yeah. Broadly speaking. Like Emily Dickinson writing the letters yeah. as a form of publication. There was this wonderful study of young black men on corners in the 1960s, very social study, yes. the important social study. And I was thinking about my father's generation and uh, the emergence of doo-wop music. And that often took place in Philadelphia on corners. And so when, when, let's say, a show like The Wire comes along and shows young black men selling drugs, I'm trying to call attention to a deeper and longer history of the presence of arts in communities of color that transcends even our kind of modern portrait. At least back then, that was my aim right. early on. There's been a lot of talk about <clears throat> how white the publishing industry mm -hmm. was, and still is pretty mm -hmm. much, uh, and that the way people of color and ma marginalized people have had to find other routes toward publication, toward getting their work out. Can you talk about how you eventually found an audience, were able to get your poetry published? I. Fortunately, two things happened. A friend of mine, part of that history is self-publishing. And right. I just reunited with a friend of mine in college. He and I, I was a student of the poet Sonia Sanchez. And he was a student who wanted to be a doctor, but he loved poetry. So he encouraged me to co-write a book of poems with him. <laughs> and we, I, this was back in the days of when personal computers was just starting to emerge, we learned how to lay out our work. Uh, we created, we wrote a press release, wow. and it was a little chat book, and that really launched my career uh, as a poet, formally, having, seeing my poems in print, right. is because I, I published it myself. Right, yeah. that's fair. His name is Wadud Ahmad. You strip back the layers a bit on a poem called a promise of canonization, you write, though I quote Wordsworth, Sagayuski, and Dow, I come from gunshots and beatdowns, raw and dirty. What was it that allowed you to move outside that kind of an arena? Mm. I To the extent that's autobiographical. Yeah, and it's quite autobiographical. You know, the literature in the midst of some of the social ills that I bore witness to, gave me an alternate view, gave me a lens by which to understand and not what critics and teachers might say, which is escape. I, reading was not a form of escape. Reading was a way for me to put in context something larger that was at play that led to uh, some of the economic disparity in my community, uh, the emergence of drugs in the 1980s in North Philadelphia and other similar cities. Um, and also the imperative, for me at least, to kind of integrate a vision of art that was profound to me. Like, 
I, I walked around with collections of poetry in my backpack, something about the thin volume of that. It was important for me to bear witness to that moment, but also to make myself an apprentice to the art and be surprised by what was inside of those books. That was, that was enormous for me. So it, it was an escape. I've been battling and thinking about that word so much. It was, literature was, art was not an escape. It was an integration. Yeah. yeah. You have a poem about another boy uh, who plays chess. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. They're called Mighty Pawns. Yeah. Would you read that poem? Sure. How do you go straight through the, could you teach me how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's the tabs. It's the tabs. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Mighty Pawns. If I told you Earl, the toughest kid on my block in North Philadelphia, could beat any man or woman in 10 moves playing white, or that he traveled to Yugoslavia to frustrate the bearded masters at the Belgrade Chess Association, you'd think I was given to hyperbole. And if at dinner time, I took you into the faint light of his Section 8 home, reeking of onion, liver, and gravy, his six little brothers fighting on a broken love seat for room in front of a cracked flat screen, one whose diaper sags, it's a wonder it hasn't fallen to his ankles, and the walls behind doors exposing sheetrock, the perfect O of a handle, and the slats of stairs missing, where baby boy gets stuck trying to ascend to a dominion foreign to you and me with its loud timbales and drums blasting down from the closed room of his cousin, whose mother stands on a corner on the other side of town all times of day and night, except when her relief check arrives at the beginning of the month you'd get a better picture of Earl's ferocity after school, on the board, in Mr. Sherman's class, but not necessarily when he stands near you at a downtown bus stop in a jacket a size too small, hunching his shoulders around his ears, as you imagine the checkered squares of his poverty and anger and pray he does not turn his precise gaze too long in your direction for fear he blames you and proceeds to take your queen. <laughs> Thank you. For some it's books, for some it's chess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that is true, actually. The, 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 the gentleman that I grew up with in Philadelphia, some played basketball, others played chess. And they were very, very good. So much so that Hollywood did a B-rated movie really? of them. Uh, they were known as the bad bishops. <laughs> Hollywood turned them into the mighty pawns. You oh. can hear the, the symbolism of that. Yeah. Um, and it starred the guy that was in, uh, oh, he was in a TV show, you would recognize him. But it was, it was an interesting movie to see these guys' lives who they, they really did travel the world. There were articles written about them because they were so good. Chess. And the marvel was that they were from this right. disadvantaged community wow, back then. Nice. Yeah. You mentioned your grandmother and your grandfather. But there's one poem you write, I'm sure my grandfather would be ashamed of my hands, for they carry nothing and are as soft and downy as feathers. <laughs> so was it kind of hard? I mean. To think of a profession like writing or poetry with a grandfather who probably did not think much of that as a profession? My grandfather, born in the South in the 1917, worked as a bricklayer. And he worked for... Which is the opposite of poetry. That's right. <laughs> uh, he worked for Grace Kelly's father, uh, Kelly Brickwork in Philadelphia. Uh, and yet, he also served World War II and yet he was very proud that he read because he had to drop out of school. Right. And that insistence on literacy right. 
was very strong in my household. So even though I, at least in that poem that you're referencing, put us at opposite ends, I, I think ultimately, truly, he was really, really proud of me. He, he, yeah, he was around for the first book, but not the second book. And he used to carry that book to the barbershop because we shared the same name. His name was Major Gooch, and I was named after him, Major Jackson. And a poem of mine was published, the first time he did that was, a poem was published in the Philadelphia Inquirer, and it was about one of his friends, Mr. Pate's Barbershop. And uh, he took it around and said, look at our name in there. And when you, have, when you have these gentlemen who are not used to seeing themselves in literature, yep. it's a very powerful, powerful thing. Yeah. That is. That's yeah. very sweet. Yeah. I want to talk about why you write poetry by hearing you read a poem called Why I Write Poetry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, well, you can describe, uh, the, the structure of this poem will be obvious to you, but you maybe you could yeah. give it a technical name for it. Sure. So Why I Write Poetry, um, I should say that this began as a moment on an airplane when I used to teach at NYU. I would... Uh, fly down on a very cheap flight early in the morning to New York. And often it was the 6 a.m. flight. Often I was tired. Often I wanted to just go to sleep as soon as I sat in my seat. But occasionally you get someone who's very bright and like, you know, your neighbor. And he asks, you know, we start talking. and What do you do? What do you do? And I told him, if I, well, if I want to talk, I'll say I'm a professor of literature. And then they'll say, oh, what do you teach? And then we can start. But if I want to go to sleep, I say I'm a poet. <laughs> <laughs> and then I can start making my little pillow, because that just shuts everything down. But this one guy was adamant. Like, just as I'm going to see, he goes, but why? And I have to admit, I was stumbled <laughs> for a moment. I was like, why do I write poetry? So when I got into my office at NYU, I wrote this poem, Why I Write Poetry. Because my son is as old as the stars, the form is anaphora. That's the formal, which repeats a word or phrase at the beginning of a line. And I often tell my students in the absence of rhyme in poetry, poets still have to make music, and repetition is one of the ways in which we uh, reach towards a sound. Why I write poetry. Because my son is as old as the stars. Because I have no blessings. Because I hold tangerines like orange tennis balls. Because I sit alone and welcome morning across the unshaved jaws of my lawn. Because the houses on my street sleep like turtles. Because the proper weight of beauty was her eyes last night beneath my eyes because the red goblet from which I drank made even water a Faustian toast. Because radishes should be banned, little pellets that they are. Because someone says it's late and begins to rise from a chair. Because a single drop of rain is hope for the thirsty. Because life is ordinary unless you plan and set in motion a war because I have not thanked enough, because my lips moisten whenever I hear Mingus's goodbye pork pie hat, because I've said the word dumb fuck too many times in my life. I probably should have skipped that one. You're good. Okay. We're all adults yeah. now. We're adults. Because I plant winter vegetables in July, because I could say the morning died like candle wax and no one would question its truth, because I could say... The, because I relished being sent into the coat room in third grade where alone I would turn off the light and run my hands over my classmates' coats as if playing tag with their bodies. Because once I shoplifted a pair of Hawaiian shorts and was caught at the gallery mall because soup reminds me of the warmth of my grandmother and old aunts. Because the long coast of my dreams it's filled with saxophones and poems. Because somewhere, someone is buying a Rolex or a Piaget. Because I wish I could speak three different languages 
but have to settle for the language of business and commerce. Because I used to wear paisley shirts and herringbone sports jackets because I better get it in my soul. Because my grandfather loved clean syntax, cologne, Stacey Adams shoes, Irish tweed caps, and women, but not necessarily in that order. <laughs> because I think the elderly are sexy and the young are naive and brutish because a vision of trees only comes to wise women and men who can fix old watches because I write with a pen whose supply of ink comes from the sea. Because gardens are fun to visit in the evenings when everyone has put away their coats and swords because I still do not eat corporate french fries or rhubarb jam. Because punctuation is my jury and the moon is my judge because my best friend in fourth grade chased city buses from corner to corner. His cousin, his father could not stop looking up at the sky after his return from the war because parataxis is just another way of making ends meet. Because I've been on a steady diet of words since the age of three. <laughs> <laughs> because I've been on a steady diet of words since the age of three. Haven't we all? Yeah, it's about yeah. For most of us. Uh, yeah. And it does emphasize the poet's role in speaking, but I think one of the things you do in this, throughout this collection is talk about the poet's listening, mm. observing. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, wanna, I want you to read a poem called uh, On Listening mm -hmm. and think about this essential skill of a poet. Before they can speak, they have to look, they have to listen. Yeah, yeah. You know, it is, I have this idea for a class that I, to teach among my graduate students, which I haven't come up with yet. And it's, it's pretty much one in which they are immersed into sensory experiences because part of what I feel like writing does is gets us closer uh, to the world, but often there's so much that is in between us and right. the world. Yes. And so this would be an immersive class of traveling. It would be an immersive class of taking some sort of art class, uh, a class within a class, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even um, putting some instruments in their hand. You know, going yeah. back to elementary school right. when they were trying to get us to when the world used to be fresh. When the world was fresh, and that's maybe that's what I think. Part of the reason why I also write poetry is to kind of reconnect with that with that part of myself that is going to whose antenna is constantly roaming about acting on curiosity um, yeah so this is called on listening and if I can give some background to it uh, I'm I am married to a poet and um, Valentine's Day like a couple of days ago you can't get away with just buying a card, you have to write a poem. And, and to some extent, you have to try and outdo each other. <laughs> you know, that's the other secret thing about this. So, on listening, if you could listen to my thumbs, then you'd hear the history of oranges. And if you borrowed your neighbor's corkscrew, you'd hear all her sorrows. And if you rode your tourist bicycle northwest along Rue de Lyon, arriving at Place de la Bastille, you'd hear three centuries of curses, the Jacobins testing their aging throats. And perchance your eyes, widened by love, took in the whole sea that is your wife's mind, you'd brush and shake the sands out of her hair, collect them in your lap, then jar the beige ground so you can study their infinite light. You need not enact silence or testify with a tongue like a yoke with no fire beneath it. Just let the little grains of your voice blossom like a crest of pine tops, then eavesdrop on your blood flowing over sinew and marrow. You know, this. It's interesting, um, I don't know if you had a question about this poem, but 
a part of me wants to kind of talk about um, the listening leads to speaking. And I think often um, I try to honor how the mind wanders at some point. Like I, I think I'm an image driven poet and the little grains of course of, are the sand, but for some reason I decide to say the little grains of your voice, speaking to the notion that um, what we say, even in books, even epics, they're just a drop in the larger conversations that we have with each other. I don't want to explain the poem away. I'm going to no, stop lovely. there. That, yeah. that was the line I wanted to ask you about. Oh, look at that. <laughs> look at that. But what I like about that poem is that it makes us listen. It makes us see more. I mean, all great poetry does. Yeah. Uh, I, there's another early poem I, I was just thinking about. Um, in the first book, there's a poem called How to Listen. And this did take place. There was a guy who stood on a corner in Philadelphia around the time that the state closed all the mental um, hospitals. And a good number of those folks wound up in Center City, Philadelphia. And it was a guy that showed up on this one corner where on my way to work I would see, see him. And one time I just decided to stop and listen. And I can tell he was a vet because he had, um, he had his jacket on. But it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the imperatives, I think, of society, which is to hear the marginalized and not easily kind of categorize them. So listening for me is, is a huge part of my practice of, of writing. Um, hopefully something is worth including in the poems. It sounds like an act of devotion. You know, I'm happy you brought that language to, to our conversation. For me, it is. I mean, I, I cannot, I cannot, if, I think faith is one in which is not, there's not easy explanations, but faith is one in which you travel and traverse your curiosity about the world um, and follow through on where it leads you. And sometimes it leads to more questions. Other times it leads to a portrait of either your interior or the world around you that feels like prayer, that feels like devotion, that feels like um, uh, chant, that feels like conjure, all of that. Right. Yeah. You think of a parable like the Good Samaritan. It's a story about noticing, about being willing to look, yeah, I mean, you know, the Good Samaritan, that's very interesting. Um, Everyone else just walks by. Yes. Particularly in the modern age. Right. And that may have to do with right. whether or not we are cultivated right. to, to not, not pay attention to each other. 2,000 years, not much has changed. Yeah. Desperate to learn all there was to learn about my heart, I sought out the ragged men and women sitting on park benches. That's really lovely. Your poetry is marked by such irrepressible energy and exuberance and delight. Why is that? Why, where does this joy come from? What sustains it? You don't have to answer that. Yeah. Just a few of my favorite lines. I am zealous for the taste of my life. <laughs> Whichever way our shoulders move, there's joy. I've subdued the stallions raging in my blood. I, that's the only line I do not believe in your poetry. <laughs> you have not, in fact, subdued them. In a poem called The uh, Poem with Borrowed Image from Mark Chagall, you write, some days I scatter fistfuls of stars out of words. <laughs> that is a perfect description of your work. But there's nothing Pollyannish about it, as you've heard. Uh, a poem called Ode to Everything begins with the ice cream cone building a paradise in my mouth. Sounds, mm. you know, sweet, a little frothy but goes on to allude to a neighbor sitting vigil with someone who's dying, mm -hmm. to the fields of World War I, to the scar on a friend's face. Mm -hmm. I want him to read that poem now for us. Mm. This is an ode to everything. So I have this ongoing 
invisible job description for poets. You have to write a sonnet. Everyone knows that. And you have to write a, an ode, a poem of praise. And in, in putting together uh, six, well, five volumes selecting, I realized that I never explicitly wrote a poem of praise, although I do consider uh, the work to kind of acknowledge a great deal of, of what I feel gratitude for. Uh, so I couldn't settle on anything, so I just wrote ode to everything out of laziness. <laughs> Somehow, I have never thought to thank the ice cream cone for building a paradise in my mouth. And can you believe I have never thought to thank the purple trout lily for demonstrating its six-petal dive or the yellow circle in a traffic light for illustrating patience. My bad. In my life, I have failed to praise the postman whose loyalty is epic, the laundress who treasures my skinny jeans and other garments, and the auto repairman who clangs a wrench inside my car, tightening her own music. Were my name called and I were summoned on a brightly lit stage to accept a little statuette after staring in utter disbelief, I would thank my dentist as well as my neighbor who sits vigil beside the dying far away from the lights, and my fourth grade teacher who brought down three tape rulers on my hands as punishment for daydreaming out a window during the exam I already completed. Mia culpa. Now that I know the value of the peaks across from Flanders Hill, I will forever express reverence for their green crowns. I will never fail again to say small devotions for the scar on a friend's face that lengthens when I walk into a room. You know that last image, someone was like, I don't get it. I said, they're smiling, right? Of course, they're smiling. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a, I think a poem, I think poetry, speaking of going back to the origin of that question, I think that's the other kind of imperative about the work that we, that we do. You know, there used to be this idea that somehow poets were endowed with kind of great c capacity to notice. And I don't think Necess that's necessarily true, but I do think the more you take the world into, whether that's through literature, film, the arts, dance, music, I do think it is a, a kind of acculturation or a practice of noticing, of, of hearing. The other side of that is when you do, when you're, when you're so full of the world, if you're an artist, it's going to come out in this in this way that is celebratory. I think. Right. I it's, think it's a, a practice of gratitude. Anyone who's cut off from that, I think, um, cut off from the world. I think we we see a withering of of a spirit. Um, it's one of not to get into pedagogical statements as a teacher, but I'm so invested in my students growth not necessarily as great sonnet writers, but writers who are going to notice and hopefully carry that into that into their work. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. You have a complicated relationship with America. How'd you notice? <laughs> <laughs> what made you say that? In a poem called Stand Your Ground, which is a very loaded phrase, contains this exasperated line, America, I've had enough. You've written a devastating prose poem about the killing of Michael Brown, Ferguson, Missouri, 2014. You reframe Brown's death as a long sleep, which is both bitterly ironic and deeply devout as a reference to the gospel account of Jesus saying, he's not dead, he's mm. sleeping. Mm. Mm. Can you speak about the way the killing of Michael Brown and the protests that erupted after that 
made you think perhaps differently about the function of poetry, the purpose of poetry, your poetry? It didn't make me um, think differently. It reaffirmed an inheritance of poetry from the poets that I had been influenced by. Um, everyone from Phyllis Wheatley to Langston Hughes, most prominently, I would say, onto the poets of the Black Arts Movement, which is to have a vision of America that does not include um, exploitation, mm -hmm. uh, that is an acknowledgement of history, not history as guilt, but history that will make us a little bit more tender and aware of each other, that a literature that humanizes us. Um, the killing of Michael Brown, how could one not write towards what effectively was a traumatic moment, not just for his body, his family, but also the community that had to watch his body. And that, for many of us, was the equivalent of during Jim Crow years when there were a rash of lynchings, leaving the body there as a forewarning for anyone who wants to step outside their place. It's hard for me not to connect those particular moments, and yet others have already done that work. Langston, he, even the poet of the Harlem Renaissance, who I've edited uh, a volume of for um, Library of America, County Cullen, has an anti-lynching poem. So I could not do that. What I decided to do was turn to our history of, of fables and think about the enchanted figure who's asleep. Later, I bring in the Lazarus reference in that, in that poem. But that particular poem was really hard for me to write. I think anyone who was writing, writing in response to the, the trauma of, of state, of, of killings of young people, people of color, um, it's, it's not a fun topic to take up. It's very emotional. Some of it is, in writing that poem, I needed to say, in the other poem that you referenced, I needed to say that for myself. I needed to come to an understanding of how this work, the process of writing, the process of writing towards justice, the, the process of writing towards the earth, towards our human spirit is really healing for me as much as I hope that it makes a contribution to aware our conscious, raising our consciousness and, and awareness around these topics. I took the Sleeping Beauty myth or the story and applied it to Michael Brown, yeah. I want you to read that poem on your own. Yeah, please. In a 2020 collection called Leaving Saturn, you have a couple of references to Caliban. <laughs> That's the enslaved creature on the island that Prospero takes over in Shakespeare's The Tempest. Remember that? So much is compacted in that character. In The Tempest, you'll remember Caliban says, you taught me language. He's yelling at Prospero, you taught me language. And my profit on it is I know how to curse. The red plague rid you for learning me your language. Mm. One of many great lines mm -hmm. there. In another poem called On Disappearing, you write, I am a life in sacred language. I want you to talk about the Caliban paradox. To be speaking in a language that empowers you, that allows you to express joy, and yet it's also the language of people who have a very grim history in relation to people of color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Such a... Mm -hmm. Shakespeare got there first, didn't he? Yeah. You know, it's very fascinating to me that some of the most eloquent, beautiful lines Shakespeare puts in Caliban's mouth. Yeah. And as a, re as a, as a result of that, 
you cannot help but think about the power, the potential power of literacy, which is how it kind of passed down to uh, poets here in America or poets who are on the margin. Caliban is a figure. And in the, in the poem that you referenced, I put Pal Caliban as a rapper um, at a street party in the 80s and says, you know, Crossroads is a sucker MC. <laughs> and so it's bringing in the idiom, the, the illusion of, of Caliban with the idiom of the streets and the age. And I'm intentionally calling attention to the power of, of hip hop lyrics, the power of, of language that is born out of those conditions. To speak back. To speak back, that's right, that's right. And in, and in speaking back, reaffirming, Caliban reaffirms himself, not Prospero, right? Yeah. There's a ter terrible, painful line in the, the narrative where Frederick Douglass talks about learning and how wonderful it is, and then he's filled with dread. Mm. Something about learning to read mm. Mm. gives him a sense of an awareness that is a, a crisis in his, in his life, in his mm. young life. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of thing Caliban's getting at there. I think the, the word crisis is exactly the word to use because to some extent, what writers who find themselves aware in that Du Boisian sense that they're writing towards um, uh, the larger context of simply being a human being, but also being marked by race, uh, the crisis is, how do, you, how do you write poems, stories, how do you sing in a way that affirms the, the essentialness of who you are and not get held up by the crisis of yeah. your condition? And that's what, that for me is the journey for a number of writers, in fact. I mean, I, we're talking about it in a racialized context with, the, with a very familiar classical uh, literary figure. But for many of us, we journey towards a portrait of ourselves that is true to us. And sometimes the conditions of whether it's your working class, whether it's your gender, your sexuality, those in a way give you your, they're your stones. But ultimately, you're, you're going to land in a relationship to language. And hopefully that relationship is, is pure. I don't want to use the word transcendent, but one that allows you to kind of see more clearly um, who we are, why we're here, right. um, and how that work might, might be a window or a mirror for someone else. You use wit and humor to confront subjects like that too, which is somewhat unusual because these are very fraught subjects. Uh, there's a witty poem uh, called Practicing Kindness about your self-satisfied liberal neighbor, <laughs> just love. Uh, if you'd read that for us. Humor is new for me. Oh, come on. No, I'm, t I'm trying to like, no, that, no seriously, I'm, I really am trying to write Nobody more funny poems. Nobody becomes funny later in life. Jerry Lewis did. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Jerry Lewis was funny from the beginning. This is practicing kindness. Now don't be, uh, well, you can, I don't mean to take over. No, but. please. It, it begins in a way that will confuse you. Hang yeah, on. Yeah, yes, yeah. That's true. My, my, my friend Josh is here, so uh, Commercial Street, Provincetown. Um, there was a moment where the foxes were coming along at night, and sometimes they would show up daytime on uh, Cape Cod. Practicing kindness. It is wrong of me to speak ill of the whistle pig or the badger or the Siberian chipmunk who engineers a complex city of burrows and galleries and pours all her life into managing her hungers across the seasons, whose foyer to polyphagic heaven is a fallen maple from eight winters back off Sparrowhawk Road. And equally, it is wrong to demean the long-snouted red fox, friend of the colonoc, and master of her errors, who lopes down Commercial Street in Provincetown at night, taking in the gently lit landscape paintings of dunes 
and storefront gallery windows, or reproductions of the Pilgrim Monument, which strongly favors the Torre del Manja in Siena, which had me shiver upon first sight while driving the hills of a Tuscan countryside the summer of 16. And I'd rather not pass a disparaging word against my neighbor, who randomly yells from his car that I'm first to integrate his neighborhood, which is his way of saying he does not see our black and brown neighbors. For example, Rumana, a third generation Bangladeshi American who's my physical therapist and lives two blocks away, or the Hawaiian med student who never fails to wave on his jog to love circle. My neighbor who has lived in Nashville his whole 75 years and inherited his piece of prime and strongly believes he's stepping into the 21st century by complimenting me on a perceived upward mobility while holding up traffic. In great perturbation, I simply yell over the honking, go on, there's a line of people behind you. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of a poem you write called uh, In the 80s We Did the Wop. Yeah. <laughs> this exhausted, teething address to white people. And you say, I promise no one is blaming you. No one is trying to replace you. You are carrying a tainted clock, calling it U European history, standing in khakis, eyes frightened like a mess of beetles. Charlotte's really man. <laughs> I couldn't help it. That was a terrifying look on those dudes' faces. <laughs> you will not replace us. Come on, y'all. <laughs> really? I'm sorry. No. You, I mean, I, there's some moments you just got, you have to write poems. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's <clears throat> and laugh. It is. It is uh, horrible and absurd. Yeah. Yeah. I, I learned a word. I learned many words from you, but this was a, not an English word. Eleutheria? Eleutheria. It's, it's, Gr it's okay. Greek, yeah. Greek word meaning liberty? Liberty, a particularly the stamp of liberty stamp. on a coin or something else. And if you read this poem, it uh, goes right to the heart of... How do you feel learning it? I the new word. Like I should have learned it long ago as an American. It sounds like the central word of our whole political yeah. ideology. Why didn't I know this word? Yeah. Why isn't it on coins? <laughs> Um, I ask that question because, for me, learning words is like that's the that's the that's the juice that's the fun, <laughs> you know. I have a OED and and I I love diving into it. Uh, someone was making a point today over lunch about how they want to get rid of their devices because you just go down rabbit holes. Right. And she was looking up a word and then that led to another word and. And her uh, husband said, you would do the same thing with a dictionary. And then we both agreed it would be a lot slower. You know, <laughs> it was like, you know, but um, I think I, because I, there is a critique of poetry being arcane that um, sometimes people put in, you know, $10 words when a, a $5 word right. would have sufficed. And I think for me, it's, it's part of the pleasure of reading. Is it's it's not it's not meant to make poetry nor language is meant to make us feel inadequate in any kind of way. In fact, it should open up possibilities, and that's one of my big beliefs about our political discourse is that it it returns to well-worn language and familiar constructs, and language should kind of clear pathway for us to kind of renew ourselves with each other and definitely with the, the materials that allow us to kind of express who we are and, and express our feelings and our desires. Yeah, hear, hear. Yeah. And I'm speaking to the choir. Yep, well, yeah, I totally agree with you, of course. And if you call the poem Liberty or even Stamp of Liberty, that does not convey the same gravitas, the same mm. history, right? Mm. Mm. Same. I hadn't thought about that. So I mean, you, yeah. you think of think of all that as you hear this poem. Eleutheria. 
There was so little to say of the iridescent grackles above the courthouse or the architecture of secrets below like a fragile vocabulary or the inundation of idols when winter thawed, whatever was hidden out of loneliness. What if we were changed at least once by nights of rain, by drunken bees in a glade of tufted vetch, by the fly-tormented psalms of Blake edging further into the breath of our knowing? This is a country with a single dream. All the counties and all the town meetings and all the demonstrations amount to a soul creation. Last night, I pictured our shadows liberated from human forms. We know the color of freedom. I've effaced the shade of maple pressed like an encyclic leaf in a book from another century no one reads. I'm imagining your fingernails, the great potential of your profile, how you may never hear the gentlest parts of my tumbling out of clouds. Sometimes we call it beauty, we the martyrs. The great poem, thank you. I have a face, the shade of maple pressed like an encyclic leaf in a book from another century no one reads. Hmm. We know the color of freedom. Do we know the color of freedom? You know, we may forget it sometimes. I think, uh, as, as we know, when this country was founded, the great contradiction, as we're discussing freedom, we also are enacting bondage. We know this history. And for many years, it activated a sense of purpose. I guess I'm writing towards, in that line, the fact that we're losing a sense of that because that history is being weaponized against us to separate us from each other. It's, it's Black History Month. That was a struggle. It was a struggle for us to kind of see something about a vision of a country, the possibility of a country, and to remind us that the least wise among us define who we are, that anyone, I don't, I don't need to, to replicate the values that we, this flag represents, you know, but the literature aims towards that, our education aims towards that. One thing I will say, um, I don't think activating, reactivating civics classes is going to do it. It's going to help. But if you reactivate civics classes without the vision of the long history of struggle, the students are going to get empty rhetoric. And I guess I'm, I'm trying to write poems that push against that and hopefully kind of remind us. You do. It's lovely. Thank you. I want you to laugh, too. At the same. I want us to be connected by laughter. I want to end with a poem called Invocation? Yeah. A poem that was written during the global health crisis. And it was, a, it was that also um, the protests around um, well, you'll hear it. Invocation. Down here, we have inherited an arcade of stars. And what kindness that can stop a bomb. We want intelligence that survives mutations. No more rallies of hate. No more stone mountains. Just proliferating peaks in the presence of friends like magical wands. We want the father in the park running behind a child peddling into her future. 
We want to turn a corner and stumble upon the muted concert of two people in an embrace with entangled eyes. We want to hear a faraway train whistle cast a spell on the coming night. Back in that faraway land, we were nurtured once on a dance floor, blazing in some tribal purity near some bride swirling in sweaty laughter as we reached for the tips of each other's fingers streaming their ambient light. Such were the new births of ourselves, breaching horizons like a sting. This is not the ending we imagined. We want to see each other again, strangers walking through curtains of rain, storms lighting up pastures laden with blossoms. What a gift this night has been. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have to say, it's been a long four years without this kind of experience in my life. Um, so happy to share it with all of you. Thank you, Ron. Major, thanks for coming here and, um, and bringing us back to uh, what we've been doing, uh, what we did once before. Um, Major, I found out when we asked him to come to this uh, uh, first redo of Ron's uh, series, said that he taught Life of a Poet in his classroom. So. Uh, it's wonderful to have you participate in it, celebrate your poems. Um, I encourage you all to get a copy of Razzle Dazzle. It's for sale in the room next door, and Major will sign your copy. Um, I also hope you come to see Ron do his magic again in April. Uh, April 11th, he'll be interviewing um, poet Robin Schiff, who wrote a book called Information Desk, and there's some real interesting connections to um, our institution. We will conclude our Live at the Library Black History Month programming next week with a conversation with Carrie Greenidge, historian, uh, with our Librarian of Congress. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that uh, on the first Live at the Library Thursday of National Poetry Month, we will feature Ada Limone, our poet laureate, returning to the library to celebrate her new anthology, You Are Here, Poetry in the Natural World. You can find out all about our programs on our website, lsc.gov slash poetry. Um, we hope you come back to Thursday nights here, uh, enjoy our programs, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>